Hello everyone, I'm Tanya Rivera. Welcome back to CBSN. This month marks 100 years since the Tulsa race massacre. It's widely considered the worst display of racist violence in American history. But the story of what really happened that day only recently came to light. On May 31st, 1921, a white mob descended on Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood neighborhood following rumors of a black teen assaulting a white woman. In a 24-hour span, the mob randomly shot and killed innocent black citizens. It also destroyed scores of black-owned businesses, churches, homes, and schools. As many as 300 people are believed to have died that day, but the exact number remains unclear. Not one person was ever charged with a crime. Scott Ellsworth chronicles the story of the massacre in his latest book, The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice. He also details how the massacre was purposely covered up for decades. Professor Ellsworth joins us now. He's a lecturer at the University of Michigan's Department of Afro-American and African Studies. Uh, Professor Ellsworth, thank you so much for joining us. Let's step back 100 years, if you will. Give us a a glimpse into life in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for a black person in 1921. You know, you recently said that this was a place where African Americans leaving the Mississippi Delta, Arkansas, and Tennessee came to get the boot of white supremacy off their throats. So can, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Well, Greenwood, as the district was called, was just an astonishing place. It was a home to uh, about 10,000 African Americans with more people arriving every day. Uh, in Greenwood, there were two newspapers. There were two movie theaters. Uh, one sat 1,000 people, the other 750. There were more than 30 restaurants serving everything from, a, you know, a sandwich or a bowl of chili to, you know, four course meals with steaks and chops and all the trimmings. There were more than 30 grocery stores and meat markets, a dozen churches, uh, more than a dozen surgeons and physicians, African-American surgeons and physicians had their offices in, in Greenwood. Uh, there were black attorneys, real estate agents, dentists. Um, there was a hospital, a public library branch, um, a post office. This was an incredibly vibrant community. Uh, and it was a community for, you know, a number of people where the American dream was really working for African-Americans. And so, Scott, your 1982 book, Death in a Promised Land, helped bring this tragedy to light. How and when did you first realize that something terrible happened in 1921? And why did it take so long for this to come to light? Were there people who tried to stop you from publishing what you had discovered? Well, I, you know, I, I learned about this as a kid. I'm born and raised in Tulsa. And even as a 10 and 11 year old, I would hear stories of older adults would talk about what we then called the race riot. But whenever you went into the room, you couldn't learn much about it. It wasn't until Really, I was a college student in the 1970s that I started to do work on it. I personally was never really threatened, but boy, that wasn't the case for people before me. Uh, in the 1940s, as late as the 1970s, there were researchers whose lives were threatened, whose careers were threatened, you know, for wanting to look into this. And, and the reason, quite frankly, is that for nearly a half a century, um, in the white community, the story of the massacre was actively covered up. Official records were stolen and destroyed. Articles were cut out of newspapers. Um, you know, it was uh, Tulsa's white daily newspapers went out of their way never to mention the event, you know, for nearly 50 years. And ironically, in the African-American community, it wasn't discussed publicly either. Uh, you think about these survivors of this horrific event, if you imagine them like Holocaust survivors, many of them did not want to share this awful trauma, uh, the memories of that with their children and grandchildren. So the, the mass, as John O. Franklin, the great historian once said, Tulsa lost its sense of honesty. And it lost it for about 50 years. And it's taken us nearly 50 years to get the story out. 
Well, you know, as you mentioned, you've interviewed dozens of survivors over the years. And, you know, last week, of course, we heard from a 107-year-old survivor on Capitol Hill. Amazing. I mean, she's just incredible, 107 years old. Um, so are we at a point now where, as a country, we can address this openly as these last few survivors are still with us? Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, the you know we've the story is out now. I mean, it's largely out. You'll still run into. I still run into people saying, "I can't believe I've never heard about this before." But I think the story is out. There'll be a lot more attention coming in the next week or so. But we have a lot more work to do. Look, uh, everyone let these people down. Uh, not only did did uh, their neighbors try to kill them and and destroy, they destroyed their homes and businesses but their city government let them down, the state of Oklahoma let them down, the federal government never investigated this horrific incident. And insurance companies let them down as well. They refused to, refused to play claims by African-American insurance holders. So I think that we have, as a society have a lot of work to do. We need to make this right, not simply for the three uh, survivors of the massacre, but also for the descendants of any survivor as well. Right. And what does make this right mean? I mean, as you know, some of the descendants are are suing for some kind of legal reparations. What does that mean? I mean, what does that look like? And, and how would the city of Tulsa embrace some of these options? Well, I think that, you know, and, I, and the city deserves a lot of credit, too, for, you know, supporting our work to find the mass graves and other things as well, too. I, I think this is going to be a national issue. Quite frankly, I, I can't claim to know what the proper figure is. There's never going to be enough. But, you know, 20 years ago, the state of Oklahoma had a chance to pay some form of financial restitution to the 150 or so survivors. They turned their back on that and instead gave them a gold plated medal. Um, I think we can define who the survivors had been of the massacre. I think there can be mechanisms created to figure out who the descendants are, and whatever the, the, the payment is, it won't be enough. But I, I think this is going to ultimately have to be a federal responsibility. Look, everyone let them down, and I think we need to, to do something to make it better. I agree. I mean, the effort has got to be there, and the, and the effort needs to at least attempt to, to match the crime. Well, Professor Scott Ellsworth, thank you so much for joining us and all of your insights. Um, I'm sure that we will have the opportunity, I hope, to speak with you again. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tanya.